Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see this number back out. So thankful for the presence of everyone that is here. By way of the order of our services this evening, Brother Tom Carraway will bring the scripture reading to us. Uh, Brother Matt Oglesby will be leading the singing for us at the appropriate time. Brother Aiden Chambers will be leading us in our opening prayer. Brother Andy Sheffield will assist with the Lord's Supper if there's a need there. Then at the close of our service, Brother Michael Ryan will lead us in a dismissal prayer. Before we begin our worship this evening, let's pause for just a moment. Focus our mind on spiritual things. Brother Carroll. Our scripture reading this evening will come from James chapter 2, beginning with verse 4. Are you not then partial in yourselves and have become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seat? Do they not blaspheme that worthy name by which you are called? If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if you have respect of persons, you commit sin and are convict, convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. <clears throat> Our first song this evening will be number 202, Beyond This Land of Parting, all three verses. <clears throat> Oh, 
Our next song is number 442. Number 442, Yield Not to Temptation. <clears throat> All three verses after this song will have our opening prayer. <clears throat> Father, we come before you this afternoon to worship and to praise your name. And Lord, thank you for giving us all safe drives out here. And please be with us through this service. Help us to be edified and to learn more about your word. Lord, please be with us who are sick at this time. Please be with Kelsey and Kyle Duncan and be with that family as they're sick. And be with others who are also dealing with illness. Thank you for Brother Frank as he's going to bring us a lesson this afternoon and help him to have a ready recollection of what he's prepared. Thank you for his sermon this morning, Lord, and help us to remember to train our tongues and not speak sin. Please be with those who have lost loved ones. Please be with the Wilsons and the Branhams and help us to comfort them and also help them to look to you for strength and comfort and loss of Brother Dale, Lord. Just be with those families. Be with the congregation at Gardendale and the loss of their preacher and be with them to find a new good evangelist soon and just be with that congregation. Please be with those who are traveling at this time. Give them safe journeys to their destination and back home. 
Please keep them safe. Lord, we thank you for our homes and our families and our clothes, Lord, and just all the things you bless us with. And thank you for the greatest gift of all, which was your son that you sacrificed for our sins to die on the cross. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> The invitation song will be number 522 if anybody's using the book and would like to mark that song. Before the lesson, we'll sing number 536, Oh, the Things We May Do, all three verses. If you'd like to, please stand while we sing. <coughs> Last quarter in our Wednesday night Bible class, we considered the subject of church history. We talked about the falling away and restoration of man. That was the title of the, of the lesson, of, of the series of lessons. And the last two lessons were division in churches of Christ in the 19th century and divisions in churches of Christ in the 20th century. There was one lesson I was not able to get to in that time period. And so I want to share that lesson with you this evening. This will be the end of that particular series. Some of you were not able to be in that class. And uh, 
I, I, I hate that you weren't because I wanted everybody to hear the message that was presented in, in that material. But tonight I want us to consider what are the current and future issues in churches of Christ. And as I observe what's going on, I see a great bleakness and frightening situations arising in many churches of Christ. We're going to talk about some of those things that are happening, that have happened just in the past 20 years, just in the 21st century. First, I want us to consider issues of morality. That's becoming a great problem in churches of Christ. Attitudes toward marriage, divorce, and remarriage are changing. And the teaching on this subject has changed over the years in churches of Christ. Several years ago, some friends of ours attended a, a worship service at a church in California. Those friends were Donnie and Janice Amos. And uh, while they were there, uh, they realized that the truth was not being taught on the subject of marriage, divorce, and remarriage in this supposedly conservative, non-institutional church. And so I decided that I would write the preacher, got the email address, wrote him a message. And I said, uh, just tell me what, what your position is on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And uh, he wrote back and he said that it was such a difficult subject, one could not explain it briefly. And I thought, you know, if you were to ask me that question, I could explain it pretty briefly. I could say, read Matthew 19.9 and Matthew chapter 5.32. That's about as brief as I can get. And then you would have what God had to say, what Jesus had to say about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Matthew 19.9, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. I, I could have written that back. Evidently, this preacher could not share that with me because that was not the position of the church there. Matthew 5.32, But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. I don't see anything difficult in those passages, do you? But a lot of people do. And a lot of people have tried to skirt around these simple principles set forth in the Word of God. Several years ago, Melissa's dad was preaching in Idaho, I believe it was, and you would remember the situation, Melissa. And he was preaching on what the Bible says about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And in the middle of that sermon, a fellow stood up and disrupted the service. Just caused a, a commotion in the service because he didn't agree with what Alton was saying as he shared God's Word on that subject. I'm afraid we may be seeing more of that in the future. I want to suggest to you that attitudes toward homosexuality are changing. Not only in society, not only in the denominational world, but also in churches of Christ. And I want to show you how this change gradually takes place by using the Presbyterian church as an example. If we go back to 1978 and look at the position of the Presbyterian Church, this is what we find. Homosexuality is not God's wish for humanity. On the basis of our understanding of the practice of homosexuality is a sin. You see that? Now, I could read that whole thing, but that's basically what it is. Homosexuality is a sin. Two years later, I want you to notice the change. 1980. In 1980, a General Assembly added homosexuality, homosexuality presents a particular problem for the church. It seems to be contrary to the teaching of the Scriptures. So it's gone from sin to seems to be contrary. Continue on. Look at 1991 and the position of the Presbyterian Church. The church should reevaluate its definition of sin to reflect the changing mores of society. Do you know what that said? 
That says society is driving the bus. Society is deciding what is right and what is wrong. And, and we just need to go along with society. It doesn't make a difference what God says. If society says this, then we need to reevaluate the definition of sin to reflect the changing mores of society. Whatever societal morals and mores are, and mores are basic units of a civilization, whatever the basic beliefs are, if society says this is okay, then the church needs to accept it as okay. So in other words, the authority is not what God says, it's what society says. And friends, we're seeing that coming into churches of Christ today. Well, let's come forward a little further. To 2015, the Presbyterian Church made a historic decision Tuesday night to formally recognize gay marriage and allow same-sex couples to marry in its congregations. The denomination voted to redefine the church constitution on marriage to include a commitment between two people, not a male and a female. And so this is the progression. 1978, the Presbyterian Church said homosexuality is a sin. In 1980, they said it's contrary to the scripture. In 1991, they said, we need to reevaluate the definition of sin. And then by 2015, we need to redefine marriage. I want to ask you a question. For those of you that have had a Bible all during that time, did you notice any change in your Bible? Did you notice anything in it changing? You see, God's Word still God's Word, regardless of what society has to say. But society is driving the ship. And society is determining what's being taught in churches. If you don't believe that, then think about what's happening in Methodist churches today. In fact, two months ago, AL.com said that the United Methodist Church is split and there are 198 churches in North Alabama that have left the United Methodist Church. Why is this a problem in the Methodist Church? Has God's teaching changed? Well, obviously not. But man's ideas about morality have changed. And they're changing churches to reflect the changing mores of society. So, boy, I'm glad that's not happening in churches of Christ. Hold on. I think about what God has to say. There's so many passages that we could deal with. With it, we can spend all of our time doing this. But in Romans chapter 1, at verses 26 and 27, I want you to notice what Paul, an inspired writer, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, had to say. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use uh, for that which is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of women, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. What was the penalty? Who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death. That's spiritual death, by the way. Not only do the same, but also approve those who practice them. So what we're seeing is in most denominations in our country today, people are approving this great sin that God says is deserving of spiritual death. But these denominations said, oh, that's not the case. You don't deserve to die. You don't deserve to be lost. God loves you. God accepts everybody. And they ignore scriptures like this. Galatians 5, 19-21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness. And I believe that's a, a term that includes homosexuality. Lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you before, just as I told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
Did you just hear people today in various churches say, oh, Paul, you were just so close-minded. No, Paul, you're writing down what the Spirit told you to write. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Uh, do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, or sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. But what are churches saying to that? Well, that's just past tense. That's not the case anymore. And such were some of you. Some people say, well, that the homosexuals can't do anything about it. They, they, they were just born that way. Paul said you can change. Of such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Yeah, you can change. Homosexuality is a learned behavior. But what about churches of Christ? They certainly would not support homosexuality, would they? Let me direct your attention to a conference that took place 15 years ago at David Lipscomb, or Lipscomb University as it's called now. The Christian Scholars Conference, June 2008. And this material I'm going to share with you was written by Wayne Jackson. Some of you are familiar with Wayne Jackson and his writings. He's done some great work through Apologetics Press. And some of you have used his books and his materials. But listen to what Wayne Jackson has to say. He says, with support from several sister schools, for example, Pepperdine University, Abilene Christian University, Oklahoma Christian University, and Harding University, it was the 28th annual gathering of some of the most radically liberal self-designated scholars on the planet. One of the most startling participants was former Abilene Christian University student Jared Kramer. By the way, I looked up Jared Kramer. He now refers to himself as the Reverend Doctor Rector of St. John's Presbyterian Church somewhere in Michigan. So he's off the rails. Kramer's topic was titled One New, New Humanity. Reconsidering Homosexuality in Light of the Ecclesiology of Ephesians. I don't have a clue what that means. If you do, tell me. Ecclesiology, ecclesiology simply means teaching. And I hadn't found anything in the book of Ephesians that teaches me about homosexuality being all right. Jared's paper engage, engages in a case study on the place of gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgendered Christians. He stated perhaps a deeper understanding of Paul's message in Ephesians can lead to a renewed perspective on the issue, of faith, uh, issue facing Christians today. We just need to go back and read what Paul said in Ephesians and get it right, he says. And Jackson went on to say, what possible justification could David Lipscomb University and its affiliates have for arranging and or supporting a program that embraces a defense of this debunked level of moral irresponsibility? And that is from the paper, Sick the Old Pass. And by the way, if you don't get that paper, you can write to the, the church in McMinnville, Tennessee, and get on their mailing list. It's a pretty good paper. It's put out by institutional churches. But I tell you what, those folks are so conservative, they're, they're fighting a battle against really the majority of their brethren. Now. Well, the Malibu Times, Pepperdine, Malibu campus. Pepperdine University introduces the LGBT scholarship. Pepperdine University, a California college affiliated with the Church of Christ, and this is from the paper, by the way, announced Tuesday that it would begin accepting applications for a scholarship to be awarded to students whose academic or personal involvement in homosexuality has demonstrated a commitment to the health of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender community. I didn't know there was any health in that community, by the way. According to a press release by Pepperdine. 
This signals a potential change in course for the Malibu California University, which has a reputation for being a conservative and unfriendly to LGBT students. Pepperdine has come under fire by LGBT uh, activists in recent years, on and on. And so they're accepting scholarships for the uh, applications. Already been a problem in the Churches of Christ with this. Been problems right here in Florence, Alabama with this. Been a problem in non-institutional church in Florence, Alabama with this. I'll tell you the problem is that we don't have the right attitude toward purity of mind. And I'm reminded of what Paul had to say. That God didn't call us to uncleanness. Notice the passage, 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 3 through 8. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Homosexuality is sexual immorality. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Learn how to control yourselves. Not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who did not know God that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter because the Lord is the avenger of all such as we also forewarned you and testified for God did not call us to uncleanness but to godliness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man but God who has also given us his Holy Spirit. That's what it boils down to. Men are now rejecting God for what society has to say. And I'm reminded of what Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 22. He simply says, keep yourself pure. And that's a great admonition for all of us. There are differences in doctrine being taught in churches of Christ. The use of instrumental music and worship. We're reminded of the passages that we use so often in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. No one who knows anything about the first century church has ever made the statement, logically, that the New Testament church used instruments of music. They simply did not do it. Colossians 3, verse 16, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Our authority for music and worship is singing, not playing. But that's happening, that's changing in churches of Christ. In 2002, these two gentlemen, Dr. Dodd and Dr. Oglesby, uh, who are professors, or were professors at Abilene, I guess they're still there. But in a study by Dr. Carly Dodd and Robert Oglesby, professors at Abilene Christian University, of 530 teens who attended Churches of Christ, they found that 9 out of 10 think instrumental music is acceptable in worship. Now those teenagers are in their 30s now. And those teenagers are shaping what is taught in Churches of Christ now. This is Jay Guin. By the way, Jay Guin is from Russellville, Alabama. He died a few years ago, but he was an elder at the University Church in Tuscaloosa. And I'll share with you his position on baptism. And by the way, let me say this. There are a lot of good folks who are in these small congregations out in the county that are very conservative congregations, and they'll send their kids off to Tuscaloosa to go to school, and they'll end up at a place like University Church of Christ and they'll get teaching like this that I'll share with you. And they'll decide, oh, well, that's what the truth is, not what I was taught back home in that little church out in Lauderdale County. He was asked to write an article for New Wine Skins, a very liberal rag uh, put out by members of the church. On baptism, he says, because of how the question has affected fellowship among believers, 
I've been honored with an invitation to address the question, what is acceptable baptism? I agreed, but I'm not feeling good about it. You see, I think it's entirely the wrong question. And then he said, the question assumes that baptism is essential to salvation. And I think it's a mistake to start with that assumption. Let me ask you, where are you going to start? You're going to start with what you think, or you want to start with what he thinks, or you want to start with what Peter had to say in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Do you want to go back and see what the Bible has to say and do what people in the Bible did? Or do you want to do what you think? Or what Jay Ewan thinks that's being taught in churches of Christ? Several years ago, this man, Dr. Mike Williams, who's a professor at Lipscomb, in a sermon that he preached at 4th Avenue in Franklin, Tennessee, and by the way, I listened to the sermon, took notes on it, he had this to say. He says, we accept all believers in Christ no matter what their religious heritage and welcome those seeking to know Christ for the first time. Our role as God's people is not to judge others, and you'll find that thrown out all the time. We're not to judge other people. Matt talked about that in Bible class. Our role as God's people is not to judge others and to be divisive, but to serve as a community of healing and unity. Let me tell you, the gospel of Jesus Christ is divisive. If you're going to do what God has to say, it's going to divide you from others who don't do what God has to say. Because uh, believers immersed in other traditions of the denominations. Because their faith in Christ Jesus are therefore welcome them to join us as part of our family. In other words, you don't have to be baptized into Christ for admission to sins. Come on! We'll accept you. We don't make that a, a rule. Well, God made it a rule. And so, he goes on to say, many of those who have come and continue to come have been sprinkled as infants. They want to join our family and we are committed to teaching the uh, immersion of believers. We're going to teach that and encourage those baptized as infants to study with us. However, if they choose not to be immersed, we welcome them on the journey as part of this family. So you can be a member of that Church of Christ without ever being baptized into Christ for remission of sins. Well, I wrote Mike, and this is what I said. My question is this. These people that you've accepted on the basis of infant baptism, Baptist baptism, no baptism, etc., are they saved? I want you to notice his response. Frank, as you know, it is God who decides who is and is not saved. Amen. Thankfully, I do not have to make that call. But we do believe that it is the grace of God that saves us. Amen. I, I believe that too. But you know what he left out of that response? Ends part in the salvation equation. You see, in the salvation God's grace, man, he's done everything he can do for the salvation of man. But if you don't do anything about it, you're going to be lost. He left faith out completely. Faith is man's hand reaching up and grabbing hold of that grace. That's where salvation is. And he left faith out totally. By grace, you have been saved through faith. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. Isn't it interesting that he left faith completely out of it? So we have this open fellowship idea. You don't have to be baptized. You just show up. And we'll be glad to take you. There's a lack of emphasis on biblical teaching in many churches today. One of the churches in Huntsville had a series, they still have it, called Mayberry Bible Class Series, where Andy Griffith taught moral lessons. So they'd go in their Bible class and they'd watch an episode of, of, of Andy and, and, and then they'd sit around and talk about the moral lessons that they learned. 
extensive quotes from men. And some of you may remember me saying this in 2002. That we went to Sunday morning Bible class, Sunday worship, and Sunday afternoon worship. Three services. There were a grand total of two verses used in those three classes. And so that evening, I, I said to the preacher, I said, you know, if you quit quoting me and start quoting the Word of God, I think you'd be a whole lot better off. And he said, well, we don't believe in proof texting. I'd never heard that before. Have you ever heard of it? And I said, well, if you, if you mean proving by the text, I want to tell you that, that Peter believed in proof texting. And Paul believed in proof texting. And Jesus believed in proof texting. And if you go back to the Scriptures and prove yourself by the text, you'd be a whole lot better off. I'm sure it didn't bring about a change in the teaching in that church. The changing role of women in churches of Christ. And this is something that's coming down the pike. And it's coming uh, Mac Lyon, uh, institutional preacher in Texas, uh, had a television program called In Search of the Lord's Way. And, and in that, one, in one of those classes he taught, he talked about the role of women in churches Christ. And it set off a firestorm. I can't believe this is coming from churches of Christ. One lady wrote, God help us. This message is from churches of Christ. I couldn't disagree more with this message. And yet people in Abilene hear that it's from the church, or from churches of Christ. Oh, Horace. No, it was from God's Word. That's where it was from. But people don't want to accept what God's Word has to say about these matters. She went on to say, pretty soon they'll all be dead, including Mac Lyon. And the problem of traditional CO Sears will snuff itself out. Now, you know what she just said? They'll all be dead soon. That's what they're waiting for. They're waiting for the old guard to die out. And I suggest when the old guard, people like Mac Lyon who taught the truth on this, when they're gone, there's not many people coming in behind them preaching the truth on these issues. Friends, there's great change on the way in churches of Christ. Well, Mike Cope, who's minister of the Highland Church, very liberal church in Abilene, and also a professor at Abilene Christian, he says, of course I think Mac Lyon's wrong. Way wrong! I'm becoming more and more convinced that only time will take care of this. You know what he just said? He just said the same thing. Pretty soon they're all going to die. Well, guess what? Mac Lyon died August 5th, 2015, shortly after this broadcast. I wonder if anyone took his place and took up the mantle and taught the truth on these issues. Or is that teaching completely gone from churches of Christ in Adelaide? Also about 2015, I believe it was, the 4th Avenue Church of Christ in Franklin, Tennessee hired a preaching intern from nearby Lipscomb University by the name of Lauren King. They brought her in as a preacher. And this is Patrick Mead and his wife. He was the minister there, and he, he defended this decision. I'll get to that in just a minute. But this is what Lauren had to say. And like if a girl feels a calling and a passion, and she knows that the Lord is telling her something to do, something, do it. But now wait a minute. Did the Lord tell her to preach? If He did, He's confused. She went on to say all the time people like God call me or the Lord made it clear or the voice of the Lord. Really all this is saying is I'm passionate about or this is something I want to do. Look at that statement. I think that's what it boils down to. This is something I want to do. Regardless of what God had to say about the matter, this is something I want to do. That's what God said. 1 Corinthians 14.34 let your women keep silence in the churches where it's not permitted for them to speak. 
but they're commanded to be under obedience, as also says the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it's a shame for women to speak in the church. That's what God had to say. And in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. And I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, but to be in silence. That's what God said. Is the source of our authority what God says through His inspired Word? Or is it what I feel? Well, Patrick joins in this and he says this. I do not believe that Paul in two verses, those two verses, passages I just shared with you, was trying to undo the rest of the Scripture. I don't have a clue what that means. I think he was addressing a temporary issue in Corinth and Ephesus. He was not trying to make rules for everybody in every time. No, these were temporary things for temporary times. <laughs> but what about all the other things Paul taught? I guess they were temporary things for temporary times too. Well, what Scripture did Paul undo? If one is not pleased with what Paul says about women keeping silence in the churches, why not pick out the other Scriptures you don't like and do away with them? That knife cuts both ways. Several years ago, I came across this website, the West Islip Church of Christ. This is on Long Island in New York. And that's their preacher. That's Katie Hayes. And by the way, she finally left the Church of Christ and went with the disciples because the disciples like those women preachers. But the West Islip Church of Christ is led by a group of gifted shepherds known collectively as the council. That's not a scriptural term. Shepherd says. The council is currently composed of seven individuals. Don Bayer, Sue Bayer, Methel Gale, Hubert Gibbons, Julie Madison, and Donna White. Now I have a sneaking suspicion that Sue and Methel and Julie and Donna are females, don't you? Now did they meet the qualifications of elders? Are they the husbands of one wife? Absolutely not. I don't know if you're familiar with this website, gal.328.com. And it is a website that designs itself as gender justice in churches of Christ. One Voice for Change, a movement seeking gender equality in churches of Christ. Well, they got real excited about Pepperdine's new chaplain. You see, Pepperdine decided they needed a new chaplain, so they did a nationwide search. And they came up with a woman. Couldn't find a man, evidently, to be a chaplain. And so those folks at GAL.328, uh, GAL328.org love this. They got excited about this. Friends, what you're looking at may be the face of gospel pre of preachers and churches of Christ in the future. This was the keynote speaker at the Pepperdine University Lectures in 2015. What do you think about this? And as I, I read about... Natty, Natty Bowles, whoever, uh, some of the things were just unbelievable. And, uh, Kobe, I know you've, you've read, you, you know what I'm talking about, some of the things she's read. Filthy language coming out of her mouth. I, I'm told that in her book, the first word is a four-letter word that you would wash your children's mouth out with soap if they said it. Keynote lecture at Pepperdine. Pepperdine welcomes back former student Nadia Bowles Weber, who attended after growing up in the Eastside Church of Christ in Colorado Springs. She is the founding pastor 
of House for All Sinners and Saints in Denver. Nadia is the author of the New York Times best-selling theological memoir, Pastrix, The Cranky, Beautiful Faith of a Sinner and Saint. She's been featured in the Washington Post, NPR's Morning Edition, Daily Beast, CNN, and on and on and on. What is so sad about this is the position that Pepperdine took in bringing this woman to be their keynote speaker. So this is Mike Cope. He's the Director of Ministry Outreach at Pepperdine. Notice what he says. In advertising the coming of Nadia to Pepperdine to speak, Cope referred to her as a former student, special guest, and my friend. He said that he was so excited that she was returning to Pepperdine, that she is an amazing leader, that she has come back to her faith, she may have come back to her faith. She didn't come back to the faith, okay? Later in life, as the founding pastor of the Lutheran church called the House for All Saints and Sinners, Cope said many are returning to the faith many are returning to the faith through the writing and teaching of Nadia Bowles Weber. They may be returning to a faith. But friend, I don't believe they're returning to the faith. If I understand anything at all about the faith presenting in the Word of God. And this is the Cahaba Valley Church of Christ, Birmingham. This is their elders. This is an old picture. I don't know if this, any of these are still installed as elders. But you've got John and Emily and Mac and Marcia and Tom. And this goes back at least 15 years ago when I first came across this slide. Do you recognize this lady? You saw her a thousand times last year on television during the election. AL.com reported in May 2022 that Lindy Blanchard has served as the pulpit minister of the Landmark Church of Christ in Montgomery, Alabama, for the past 25 years. The church has both traditional and contemporary services. That means you can get it with instruments or without instruments. There's a problem with entertainment and recreation in churches of Christ. People have bought into this wholesale in the last 20 years. And you've heard me make this statement before. I can remember when there was not a single fellowship hall in Churches of Christ in Lauderdale County, Alabama. All of this has happened in my lifetime. That's how the church has changed for the last several years. Notice what Paul says about these things. 1 Corinthians 11, 22. What, do you not have a house as deep drinking? Or do you despise the church of God? And shame those who have nothing. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. Now this is a generic statement condemning a specific, a specific problem with the Lord's Supper. I understand. But I'll tell you what, the generic condemns the generic. Not just the specific. In verse 34, if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. He didn't say the Lord's Supper. Lest you come together for judgment. And the rest I will set in order when I come. And in Romans chapter 14 and verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. That's not what we're all about. But righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. If you believe in the necessity of authority for what you practice. And you're involved in the social gospel. Please just give one verse of Scripture for doing it. Hey, you can't do it. The growing problem of fun and games, sports, and recreation that we've noted before and mentioned several times that the work of the church is threefold. It's evangelism, edification, benevolence for needy saints. That's it. And yet people have come along today and they've added to the mission of the church. They've added fun and games and gymnasiums, family life centers, Fellowship halls, on and on and on. 
social things in a spiritual institution that were never authorized by our Lord. And by the way, this is the Palisades Church of Christ in Birmingham. This is their dance teacher. John T. Lewis has to be rolling over in his grave after seeing something like this. They hired a dance teacher in the church. And they were so excited about their dance teacher and they offered all these different classes. What's that got to do with the salvation of mankind? What's that got to do with the work of the church? Nothing. The progressive movement in churches of Christ, and some of these things we talked about are a part of that progressive movement. But Greg Tidwell, who's the editor of the Gospel Advocate, and by the way, I think the Gospel Advocate's gone out of business. I hadn't heard anything from him in a year or so. And Colby was at this meeting and heard him say this. In 2017, he said that mainstream churches of Christ lost one third of their churches one half of their members to the progressive movement in Church of Christ. Think about that. Mainstream churches of Christ are dwindling. And these progressive churches of Christ are growing. You can see it right here in Florence, Alabama. You look at some of the more conservative institutional churches in Florence, Alabama. What's happening? They're dying on the vine. Because they're going to these churches that are providing more and more of these activities that are unauthorized in Scripture. Celebration of holy days, holidays in churches of Christ. Oh, it's got to be a big thing. And by the way, let me just mention this. You know, Christmas fell on Sunday last year. And I drove by two churches of Christ on the way to this building. And there was not a single car in either one of those parking lots. You think that tells you something? Celebrating Christmas was more important than celebrating Christ and coming together on the first day of the week. Paul said in Galatians chapter 4, verses 10 and 11, you observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid of you lest I have labored for you in vain. It's interesting about the Otter Creek Church in Nashville. It's located on Granny White Pike. Julia's parents lived on Granny White Pike across the street from Lipscomb. Several years ago, Granny White, uh, Otter Creek started running off the rails. They got involved in all kinds of spiritual speaking and all kinds of different things. And this just talks about some of the things they did. The last sentence there, for example, on Ash Wednesday, a blessing of marking with ashes is in one of the stations that they had. How can the Lord's church get to that point? One step at a time. Church in Huntsville invited a rabbi to speak at their special Easter service. Why was the Church of Christ having a special Easter service? At Christmas time, Christmas wreaths adorn the entrance to doors of churches of Christ all across the land. Christmas parties are held inside the building. Raymond Elliott had an opportunity to meet him a few years ago, an institutional preacher that's very conservative. He said, it is evident that we are witnessing a major division of brotherhood. Raymond. And then there's all kinds of church organizations, most churches of Christ are involved in support of human institutions to do work God gave the church to do. Nowhere in the Scriptures do we find this arrangement or do we find non-Christian church. And yet that's happening in many, if not most, of the churches today. There's all kinds of programs out there, the Church of Christ Disaster Relief Effort, and they do a great work. A wonderful work. They provide relief for a lot of people. But the question is this, is that the work of the church? And the answer is no. Because you cannot find book, chapter, and verse where the Lord's church took its money and gave it to an organization to go out and take care of all these different situations. The Agape House, when I was a student at Lipscomb back in the late 60s, 
I went to the Agape House. I learned about the Agape House. It's a home for unwed mothers. Primarily young women that are members of the Church of Christ. And it served as an adoption agency. And it was supported by Churches of Christ. I'm sure they do a lot of wonderful things. A lot of good works. But is that the work of the church? If it is, where's the book, chapter, and verse that tells us that we have the right to be involved in these things? And there are a number of other areas of concern. Change in the Lord's Supper. Some of you are familiar with John Mark Hicks' book, Come to the Table. And many churches have gotten involved in this. And I talked to a fellow that who, who participated in one of these services. And he said that when they had the Lord's Supper, they had this huge area, I guess a gym with tables set up all around it. And they had pitchers of grape juice and plates of bread. And they would have groups, about eight or ten around a table. And he said, and then they would give each table a topic to discuss as they partook of the Lord's Supper. But I'm wondering, how could they focus on the death of Christ if they were spending their time dealing with a particular topic that somebody had given to them? How could they do that? Seventy AD doctrine. Teaching that Christ has already come and He will not return again. That's been a problem right here in this county. A preacher in a non-institutional church preached this doctrine, taught this doctrine, believed this doctrine. I don't know if he preached it, but he certainly held that position. And he eventually left the church. Paul warned about that in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 18. Who astray concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already passed and they overthrow the faith of so. And then there's the, the, the thing about social drinking. That's coming into churches. You can be assured of that. It's a real problem. Gambling. I preached on that subject at the church nearby. And after service, a young man came up to me and said, you see that group of people over there? I said, yeah. He said, they're over there talking about how silly your sermon was on gambling. They didn't see anything wrong with it. Immodest dress is a problem in churches of Christ. And many churches would not touch that subject with a 10 foot pole. So there's all kinds of problems in churches of Christ. And I've just shared with you a few of them. Let me conclude by saying this just because the building says Church of Christ on the front of the building does not mean it is of Christ. What goes on inside the building determines whether that church is of Christ. Now, I don't get to make the decision on which candlestick gets removed. That's not my business. That's the Lord's business. But friends, I'm going to tell you, in my humble opinion, there's a lot of churches the Lord would not recognize that have the name Church of Christ across the front of the building. I know these are things that are not pleasant to think about, but they are things that we need to know about. We need to be aware of them. We need to be careful not to become wrapped up in some of these things. At this time, we offer the invitation of Jesus Christ. If there's anyone here who's never obeyed the gospel, like to be baptized into Christ, like to have the prayers of the saints, we'd be more than happy to help you if you'll come as we stand and sing.
Lord's Supper has been left prepared for anyone who didn't have the opportunity this morning. Would you please stand or raise your hand? <laughs> 